Thank you for coming to today's session. Uh, today we're going to talk about observability. And we have Mr. Paul Bruce from Tricentus with us today. He's going to talk about how observability fits in with DevOps and why it's so important for us to pay attention to it. This is not a new idea. It's an idea that is gaining traction. Paul himself has been involved in ensuring that we bake this in really well into our DevOps standard, which is the IEEE 2675 standard that you've heard me talking about very often. And Paul uh, contributed hugely to that standard and for which we are incredibly grateful. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hopefully Paul will be. So thank you for joining us today, Paul. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen and then just confirm if you can see that, please. And we're good. Okay, great. Move some toolbars around. We call them toolbars for a reason. Uh, okay, so um, hello um, and thank you, Ruth. First off, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Ruth on and off for like more than four years now, uh, working on a standard for DevOps principles and practices that can actually apply to high compliance, you know, actual companies and organizations in the world, as opposed to just the unicorns that sneeze and uh, fart rainbows and sprinkles. So um, we've been doing that. And uh, I've been on a journey myself uh, for about five or six years, um, getting deeply invested in my local communities. Um, when I say invested, I don't necessarily just mean financially. I definitely mean rolling up my sleeves and uh, doing what we would call haul water and chop wood, actually doing things to help um, get the job done, but also the meta of that is to help it get done better and to reduce toil. And those communities, one of which, one of the biggest communities that I do um, is the Boston DevOps scene. So DevOps itself does have a lot of notions in it. One of the notions that I take seriously in all my life is not just a uh, reduce toil, but um, do as much as you can to eradicate it. And there's a difference between expecting some toil, like a pragmatist should, and tr really trying to have a goal that says no toil means that you cannot leave toil behind you. Uh, and that, that makes you want to work better. And so one thing you should probably know about me um, I use a lot of post-its uh, so that I can capture things, put them out of my head. Um, any questions you have as we go along, feel free to use the Zoom chat um, or whatever mechanism and, and Ruth will get them to me and we'll, we'll get them answered. Um, and we'll leave a little time at the end, you know, so you have time to think about some things, maybe some questions at the beginning are answered throughout. So we'll, we'll kind of leave time for questions afterwards. But I, I have my feet in a lot of sandboxes. Um, most people only have two feet. I have to have far more than that. Uh, so I work, like I said, in the Boston DevOps and uh, organized the DevOps meetup uh, in Boston. Uh, I am full-time employee at a company called Tricenis, uh, who does you know testing and quality related tooling and software. Um, the My role there, I invented, created, uh, inhabited, and now I'm handing off to somebody else. Uh, customer engineering is how to engineer customers uh, and new markets, but also how to engineer your organization to better fit customers. Because when you treat your customers as sort of like, you know, we're in this together, it really matters that you have alignment with them, that you know what they're doing and they know what you're doing. And it's, it's a positive um, feed forward there. Uh, I also run a couple of other events off to the side, kind of hypotheses, uh, little sandboxes that I can play around with ideas. <clears throat> One of which is uh, DevSecOps Days Boston that's coming up on the 26th. And don't worry, I will remind you about that with a whole other slide. Um, and we'll get to this in a second. But the, the reason I run these things like OliFest um, in May and DevSecOps Days Boston is exactly that improvement mindset, right? Uh, how how to do this better. And I can't expect a very heavy full motion thing like DevOps Days Boston that attracts upwards of 700 physical people in a physical venue when we do it as a physical event, right? I can't expect them to be able to pivot really quickly on these interesting notions of how to run things a little better. So I do that off to the side. I run them in my own sandboxes <clears throat> and then I can bring back the learnings of what, what didn't work 
didn't work and I can bring back meaningful learnings. So it's always very important to be able to not only roll up your sleeves, but also be able to do things off the side. Side hustle is a big thing for me. Um, yes, I'm a United States citizen and yes, I work in this economy. So I tend to uh, be a workaholic, um, but not everybody has to do that just to be able to have kind of the side hustle to figure things out that maybe you don't have the bandwidth or the appetite over in your main thing for. So with that in mind, uh, I, I've sent the link to this deck. These are reminders. Uh, Olifest happened and all the talks are recorded. So <clears throat> anything we talk about today, primarily focused on observability, um, is probably covered in depth, including business cases and what works and what didn't, and all sorts of great stuff from a whole bunch of other people in that space. Uh, not to mention uh, the one of the chairs of the Open Telemetry Project, Liz Vaughn Jones, was kind enough for the past two years to be part of my events around observability. And uh, she brings a great wealth of knowledge and expertise to that space as well. Um, and then DevSecOps Days Boston um, is coming up. Uh, so, uh, so Ruth asked me to uh, talk about some things. And at first, uh, I wasn't clear what I should do because in reality, we talk about standards and how as part of a standards body, well, you know, um, I tried to go through some titles of what, what I might do for this group and uh, ult ultimately was like, well, you know, DevOps is kind of what happens when you really don't have any standards and don't go to school for a proper vocation. Um, I went to a couple years of college and uh, started making a lot of tech money and uh, started paying for other people's bills very quickly and early on. Um, and it's been since then the school of hard knocks. Um, and a lot of that had to do with spending too much of my young days focused on tech learning and learning all about different technologies that guess what, come and go. Uh, and over those years, not as fast as I probably could have or should have, have been able to learn how to communicate and to collaborate more effectively with various groups like the IEEE group that, that Ruth and I are in. That was also a, a learning cycle as well for me. So <laughs> when I say this, it's part a joke, but it's part not a joke. Um, up until the point where we were starting to pay attention to the fact that uh, how do you operationalize some of the, the junk that's kind of uh, uh, coming out of the uh, DevOps, you know, populist, popularized thinking uh, and how that stuff is nice narrative, but it doesn't really work in practice. Uh, it became very clear that yes, there are some standards that we have to bring in the body of knowledge about what we've been doing as a software industry for almost 50, 60 plus years and what things still remain as necessary and important. And how do we address, how do we synthesize and fold in things that come along our way that are new and interesting motions. And in that way, that's how I got involved in the open telemetry uh, community was because it's a good idea that's happening now. Uh, it happens to be a cloud native computing foundation project, but it inherits an interesting collection of meaningful characteristics that aren't present always in open source or in other software projects. So I had to take a step back. Like I saw that, that was a nice thing. Um, I started getting involved in that group. But then I kind of had to retroactively learn more and more and more about what observability is. So I'm by no means an expert. I've layered it into a couple of things. Um, I now start to think about how do we measure and what are meaningful measurements that go into systems. And I think that's about as all as much of an overlap between observability and DevOps, right? DevOps is a bunch of things. It happens to be a sort of a, a, an approach to cultural uh, to culture and engineering practices and mindset over here. Observability is a completely separate topic, but they kind of fold together as soon as you start to realize that it's not good enough to guess. So when I say, what is this observ observability tripe? It's kind of the sarcastic way of saying, what is this new thing? Come on. I mean, like we get thrown new things all day long. And so the, the if you were to look out on a general definition of it, it's about how well you can infer what's happening inside a process uh, with based on its outputs, right? Um, so kind of think about the state machine and say, okay, you know, I only have an outside perspective. 
what can I infer about how that thing works? Is that ever good enough? Do you think it's good enough when your systems are constantly, when your containers are failing in AWS uh, and you have to go figure out why and only after about six to 12 hours do you realize it's because those big fat Oracle systems over there were not, uh, were, were saturated and had no more connection in their connection pools available. So therefore the containers couldn't start up properly. Their health checks were failing. Those kind of things aren't stuff you can just sit back and go, hmm, I wonder, Sherlock, what might be going on, right? This is, this is not a hypothetical, right? <laughs> your, career, your career is going to be full of these things if it's not already, uh, as many of you are already in the field. So you, you get that, right? It's not good enough to just infer um, on the inside. A more specific and more appropriate way to kind of think about observability from my perspective is how well your digital systems, uh, you've, you've embedded agents, and I don't mean agents like uh, just software agents, I mean actors, right? Meaningful uh, places in your code and in your infrastructure whose sole job is to emit important signals about that system state so you have a better view of that thing. Um, I, I should have pulled this in, but there was a graphic on another slide I had that was somebody running on a treadmill while a nurse was monitoring them. And the most important thing about that chart to me was how many, uh, what are they called? Um, diode, not diodes. Um, how many of the little uh, wires and suckers, the the measurement devices that were that are placed on you when, let's say, a system, your human body or a digital system, is put under pressure or is put in operation, they would never run you through a stress test at a doctor's office like that without hooking you up to those nodes, because if they run you too hard and you collapse that's a bad place to be. So what do we do to prevent away from that kind of situation? We start to measure, we start to figure out what are the signals, what are the, uh, they might call them in the DevOps uh, reading in the handbook or in the Google Site Reliability Engineering Handbook, which is good. Uh, they would call them SLIs, Service Level Indicators. Um, uh, a common practice is to measure the NetRAM disk CPU on a machine. Yeah, but that doesn't help you when you've got a service that inside the service, inside the actual microservice, there is this notion of asynchronous code and things are starting to queue up, right? The queue is getting longer and longer. To be able to emit that queue length is an important signal from that type of microservice so that you can measure it externally and go, hmm, I don't just have to guess why the CPU is, is or why the memory is, uh, is exceeding its limits. I have more meaningful input, right? So one of the people, uh, one of the vendors in the space that have been early on Honeycomb, uh, along with things like light stuff and stuff at, at Honeycomb, one of the founders, her name is Charity. Uh, and she's a very awesome and outspoken person, has a lot of good opinions, uh, very opinionated. But uh, one of the things she says about observability best is, you know, it's never not a good thing to put your glasses on before you go out driving. So if you're the type of person who needs corrective lenses or something like myself, right? Um, if I leave my glasses at home, I cannot drive. I can try, but I, that would be a dangerous situation. I need to be able to have good visibility and I need to be able to deserve the road in front of me, not just the road behind me. So it's not just good enough to measure things after you put them in production. You have to think about what measurements you have to de deliver and deploy along with those awesome digital systems you plan on building. Right, and that's why observability in and of its own right is a topic, right? It's just like how people are like, what is your release process and how quick and what is your, what is your total cycle time? And you can measure it when you start to put names on things and start to go, okay, the release process is different than the continuous integration process. Continuous integration is all about making sure code works when multiple people are messing with it and it has to be brought together to make a single you know, deliverable, okay? That's CI. But the actual delivery process is a different thing as well, you know, and these th two things should work together. When you start to when you start to put proper names on things and then start to ask, how do we measure the success and the efficiency of these things? You start to realize that it, it is a thing of in its own right. So observability 
on a system, you can have a system that is very low observability, right? Very hard to observe what's going on. Um, maybe this is a little more real, a bit more real than necessary uh, of an example, but uh, it comes from one of my friends in the, the observe space. Uh, I ran Alifest this year and then last year as another conference. And one of the one of the examples they brought up was that they were working for a client that had a number of um, shipments of protective equipment um, not getting prioritized over like, you know, toy dolls, you know, those those uh, troll dolls that you could play with their hair. Who cares about those things when people are dying? And so the the importance of understanding how data flows through your system, the traceability uh, of your data right as well and that's part of observability um how to extract meaningful information from your systems after the fact that's kind of looking at logs right and then metrics those signals that you emit right this is a very important thing and i hope that y'all go into a broader situation where you are delivering very important stuff into this world because there's a lot of things about this world that are not cool and especially due to the poor decisions made by uh, some technology leaders. And the chance to build better things doesn't just mean let's find the right use case, let's do the right thing. It also means building it right. So observability to me is now a minimum viable thinking and piece of the puzzle, uh, just like the testability of a system is, right? If you can't, if there are parts of your system that you cannot test because the testability isn't even there, then why are you putting it out into the world? It could damage, it could, on, on a good day, somebody just doesn't get able to, they can't buy that little doll that they want. On a bad day, they're denied a loan for no good reason, and then that spiral is out of control and then they lose the ability to buy that house that they want to, which means so on and so forth. Or worse, right, PPE equipment. So it's very important to be able to build observability into your system so that you can actually not just before the fact or after the fact, but during, in real time, um, figure out what's going on in your systems and how to diagnose, triage, and, and resolve them. Okay, enough of that. Um, the thing is right now, there's no really good, uh, there's no like one definition for observability, <laughs> like what goes into observability, but I would say that uh, at least the commonly accepted elements are, like I said before, logs, right? Logs coming out of your systems is an important part. It happens everywhere. It's standard out, right? Um, very different AWS or whatever cloud-based uh, logging mechanisms. Uh, those are very useful piece of information, but they're an output, an outcome of your system already having done something. Um, oftentimes we look at logs because our systems have done something wrong. So with that in mind, uh, logs is one piece, but that's not good enough, right? If you're just looking at after the fact. Traces are uh, another component. It's the idea that let's just let's just take your mobile phone, right? You got a mobile phone, you want to put an order in. How many systems do you think it goes through? Well, not just the internet, but I mean, of the designers of that system, Amazon or you know whatever it is that you know, um, it generally uh, may go through dozens or hundreds of different subcomponents in code. But specifically, uh, if you were to look at the higher level architecture, you'd see dozens of systems that it has to touch and, and interact with. And so traces are, are the concept that from the inception of the original ask, all throughout each of those components as one request from, from your web application into your, into your front end APIs goes through maybe two, three, four, five, how many other APIs it should carry with it, guess what? RESTful APIs do have headers, right? That's a spec on the HTTP um, uh, specification. So uh, these headers are oftentimes used to stuff extra information. Things like, you know, geo, uh, or I, sh I should say load balancing, uh, stickiness. Um, there are things like, you know, uh, I think W3C has now a spec for a trace context, which defines sort of what, what should the header be named how should the format be, what kind of information you can put in that. Um, but ultimately that little, it's, think about it like a cookie uh, in a, in a, on a web page, but it's kind of like a traceable thing, not necessarily cookie related, 
but a traceable thing that can be handed from system to system. And it's not just HTTP, right? This spec could also apply to, let's say your gRPC calls or your JDBC calls directly into databases and stuff. So um, traces, right? When you don't have those, it's kind of just a mess of requests going everywhere, right? Uh, hopefully they fire in the right way. And maybe you work for a company that has the financial luxury of being able to pay for these huge APM solutions and deployed across thousands of servers in your organization. And maybe you have a little help and luck to reconstruct that chain yourself through some fancy tooling. But honestly, the, the longer we deal with this, I've seen Fortune 100s in the, in the States uh, that have been doing this for 15 years before APM even thought about traces as super important. And they've built their own frameworks to essentially do this. Well, after a certain amount of time, this stuff is like, isn't this obvious? We should have this. And if we have this, we need a specification and it can't be vendor specific because then we can't switch tools, teams and stuff and retain that concept. So it has to be vendor agnostic. So that's where we get the W3C. That's where we get some of these specs after a certain amount of time, these ideas become ubiquitous and now th there has to be a standard for them. And the last part is metrics, right? Like I said before, metrics that are like, you know, um, you might have used stats D or, uh, you know, Prometheus or a few other tools to measure whether it's single point in time measurements of a particular, like the queue length, or whether it's a time series set of data points that you can historically look back and go, okay, the sum of these are X, but I've got the individual data points, right? These little signals and these tiny bits of information, usually including time series data so that you can reconstruct when and how and where. Um, but, oh, by the way, metrics aren't just about what and about when, they also have to contain context like where, like which servers and services emitted them, right? The origin data. Um, you should be able to tack on metadata in your code uh, to these metrics to say this metric, uh, I, in this moment in code, if you were the code, I have the customer ID. I also understand the geographic destination. Maybe those are pieces of metadata that I should be able to attach to a metric to ship that off so that when we are looking at different segments, we know how well we're doing on, let's say, the East Coast versus the West Coast or in a different geographic region. And to be able to slice and dice that information means that you have to have metadata on this stuff. So some other things that we kind of agree on now in the observability space are building on vendor-specific implementations. I won't name names, but they've all been kind of doing their own trace thing for a while. But ultimately, now they're all sort of like, OK, I guess we have to be doing a standard because now a standard's a thing. Um, those implementations of the old sort of very proprietary ways, you pull in some vendor specific library, then you have to write that in your code. And what happens if you want to use a different vendor for APM? Or what happens if you want to use a different view, you leave that vendor, but like use a different view or a different uh, type of system like Grafana or Kibana or a visualization tool. Um, well, now all of a sudden it doesn't comply because it's it's very specific to a vendor. Um, what it really does is make it really hard. The switching cost of doing that um, is really hard. And anytime you have to, let's say you you realize this is a problem for you and you say, okay, well, maybe there's a standard out there and we're gonna rewrite our code to use the standard. That still is a code change. Even if they're supposed to be very low impact statements in your code, kind of like how you do logging logging statements should be low impact, right? Um, but even if you're going to change that, you're changing code, which guess what? The bigger and, and more com high compliance that uh, your environment is and that you have to ship code from to production users, you know, the, 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 the more professional your code is, the, the more quality checks it has to go through to get out to production. And every single change has to go through, hopefully now, what is more like an automated process for that. So the point is you, you do wanna base yourself on standards that are cross vendor and vendor neutral and vendor agnostic as much as possible so that you don't have to constantly be going back to your code 
just because somebody at the business level made a different decision. Oops. Now all of a sudden, what are you going to do? You're going to tell them, sorry, because you made that decision, it's going to take another three months to rewrite everything. They're not going to like that. And they're not going to accept that that means that you don't have time to ship the story points <laughs> in an agile mindset, right? And, and do the work you might have already signed up for, right? So that's why we, we need to, and this is where the, the let's reduce the toil to putting observability in a very practical way into our code, into our systems. We wanna be as vendor neutral as we can um, at that level so that we can enable ourselves to be able to make decisions about switching and stuff. That's just the real world talking. That's me and the real world talking. Um, everybody agrees that there needs to be then a common standard. Um, not exactly what is what is being shipped, right? Not what metrics, not what traces, not what logs, but how, right? What, what is the wire protocol format between the, 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 the libraries in your code versus the thing that it's going to ship that data to? And then when it ships that data to that, there should be various plugins that make it more specific to go to various different, um, more proprietary solutions. And that's what L OTEL uh, or open telemetry is all about. That's what I got so excited about, right? Um, and it really does have to be highly scalable. Uh, there's some stories at uh, Ali Fest. Ali is short O11Y. We pronounce it Ali, uh, kind of like a skateboard trick, yeah, Ali. Um, but O11Y is shorthand for observability. It's taken from A11Y, which is accessibility. Uh, so it's just shorthand for that. Uh, so Olifest, at Olifest, there was a uh, Skyscanner, um, and I think SimpleBet as well, these two companies, uh, and the stories from the people who drove the change to move to open telemetry. Um, the one with Skyscanner, Dave Lucia, I believe Dave Lucia, um, he talked about the fact that um, the way they were doing metrics and traces and logs before, uh, he didn't want any service disruption. So when they needed to switch out the back end of how all this stuff worked, right, nobody even knew about it, right? It took them time to figure out how to do that and how to update the libraries and stuff like that. But it was all these, at the end of the day, they had it so well planned out that it ended up just being dependabot updates in Git to basically say, you know what, we're going to swap this library out for you, right? Compatibility wise, it's the same. Uh, and then on the back end, it ships to Otel and here's your new, sh your new screens. Um, and if there were any kind of retro legacy systems that needed that data, they already um, been porting it to that stuff, right? But he was talking about like hundreds, thousands of services, but hundreds of different teams at Skyscanner. And that's a scalability problem, right? How do you scale this out? How do you pattern it out and make it something that people would rather go to than the stuff they already know? That's that's a tough order, right? If they already know, if it's already layered in, you know, there's already sort of a kind of a cliff that you have to typically go at to make them do something new and different. So uh, whatever it is, right, the, the system, the standard has to be scalable and pluggable um, to support lots of different tool sets like Jaeger, right? Um, backward support for Jaeger and stuff. Uh, and then clouds, right? AWS, Azure, GCP, DigitalOcean, those kind of things. Um, recent observability history is that there were early forerunners. They really tried to kick it up and do a lot of marketing and stuff. There was a lot of interest there. That led to a bunch of events. Uh, well, it led to two projects in the CNCF, Open Census and Open Tracing, which have been retired now and folded together and into, and the collaborators and contributors there are now working on open telemetry. So open telemetry really is kind of the, 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 the now the new uh, way to, to go about that. Uh, that led to a bunch of early work around getting the W3C trace context to be accepted um, and the formation of open telemetry as a, uh, as not, a, we just got a pull request from somebody to, to make it an incubator project. So, oh, for going from a sandbox. So it started as a sandbox back here based on some of the works already being done and a lot of motion in the early days. And now, <laughs> for better or for worse, 
if you haven't been on Google or Facebook or no, not Facebook, LinkedIn or any one of these sort of more business oriented or Twitter in the past, I don't know, two years, uh, you, you might be surprised to learn that most APM solutions, application performance monitoring solutions are trying to reinvent themselves quickly. And the easiest way they can do that is throw the hashtag of observability on there on their normal stuff and throw some extra features in there to justify the rebrand, right? However, there are some people who are actually putting in time and energy. Remember I talked about hauling water and chopping wood. There are a few people from Splunk, right? Dave McAllister um, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, Dynatrace AWS, right? Uh, Yana Dugan, uh, who was my day two keynote for Alifest is at AWS, was at Google. Uh, does meaningful and regular contributions to the open telemetry project. So they're, they're not just doing that because their employer said so. They're doing it because they're people that know the importance of this thing. And oh, by the way, yeah, big employers like take notice and care, right? And so they'll give them a fat paycheck, sure. But in the meantime, they're still doing really important things and really useful things. So look, contribution comes from everywhere, not just from random people that are doing this just because of the kindness of their heart. Um, but just keep in mind the rebranding and the catch up means that there's a lot of hashtag observability crap out there. Um, and just because a vendor says this is what observability means, it's their, it's their own bias. So just watch out for that bias as usual. Um, and then there are other, some big players, right. Uh, that, that like to come in after the fact, uh, and kind of, you know, say that they're doing things. I think, uh, AWS recently, uh, a while back actually. Uh, released a sort of open telemetry stack, like a primer, like here's what you need to get started, which is great and all, um, but they kind of unnecessarily announced something that didn't exist before it existed. Whereas the rest of the open telemetry community was like, we haven't even hit 1.0 and you're what you're announcing 1.0, who are you? Who are you people even? So there is a little bit of like a, hey, you know, if you're part of the community, best way to get involved in the community, number one is definitely look at Olifest and there's a whole second day that really pumps that message of if you if you care about this stuff, you want to get involved, we got a community here, right? It's not just about helping us haul water and chop wood. Um, I'm on one of the SIGs, the special interest groups. And it's not even a hyper technical one, right? I'll, I'll sit in occasionally on, on some of the more technical uh, special interest groups. But I know the light the what I can help with is very light and what I do okay with uh, as well as the technical stuff is also some of the communications and marketing stuff. So um, on the uh, the hotel marketing and the communications uh, special interest group, there are a number of people who help to make sure that the docs are up to date, that there's a pull request and that there's a peer review on that stuff and that the site is up and it's working, right? So there's a lot of stuff that you can do in that community uh, that doesn't just mean jumping in and trying to make uh, changes to people's stuff that you, who are you even? Like they don't even know you but it's a very open and uh, welcoming community from my experience. Uh, and there's open telemetry. So open telemetry is essentially a way to decouple the process of emitting metrics and collecting metrics and traces and logs from your systems uh, so that there are some general bindings for each of the languages and, um, and various stacks, uh, which emit out to now what is preferred to be the default, which is a kind of a sidecar situation where you've got kind of the hotel collector. It's something that kind of sits there and waits for these signals to be emitted um, or the logs to be uh, produced and collect those separate from your actual system because it's not your system's job to halt in order to make a logging call. Keep in mind, like, though these things are very important, observability, I just told you observability is super important, right? If that materially degrades your system performance, that's a problem. So what we try to do is decouple these things, make them as async as possible. And the best way to do that is to make the responsibility of receiving and kind of processing those signals and those the, the logs, traces, and metrics uh, as a separate agent, completely separate from the way that your actual software runs. Um, the collector uh, sends to one or more backends um, and as does all the other things um, that, that take advantage of this. Cool thing is uh, this is broken out that the open telemetry 
project is a whole bunch of little projects. Um, there's a bunch of projects around the SDKs, like for obviously Java, C Sharp, Go, Python, Ruby. I'm missing a bunch, but there's a bunch of these client SDKs for specific languages. There's a separate group for the API spec. Just what should the API look like? And I don't mean like a RESTful API, and I don't just mean like, yeah, it includes the API that these SDKs are written on, right? The core functionality, remember the, oh, and the line protocol. If you're going to write something that parses the line protocol, you need a standard for what the line protocol is supposed to look like. Similar to if you've ever seen the W3C web driver spec is an outgrowth and an outcome of all the work for, for over a decade and a half now of the Selenium project, the testing uh, framework Selenium. Selenium was a special case in the implementation of these good ideas. We had to elevate it up to a standard and the wire protocol is, is actually an important thing to pay attention to. And along with the open telemetry assets now are some auto instrumentation things. Uh, there have been some APM uh, providers, uh, I'm thinking right off the top of my head, Datadog, uh, early last year, I think, they were kind enough to contribute uh, the components the, that do not need Datadog to function, but they're the components that sit on the system that will uh, measure and monitor the system metrics for various different uh, languages and application, uh, I should say runtimes, right? Like the JVM, the .NET CLR, right? Those things are, are things that you need to be able to measure, not just the NetRAM disk CPU, but also, you know, processor, queue length, thread pool, all that kind of stuff down there. Um, and so uh, Datadog contributed a couple of what's called auto instrumentation, which is, look, if it's a JVM running, we've got something that understands enough to understand JVM. It doesn't understand the details of your code, but it does understand JVM or, or, or the, the CLR, right? So it can get a little more what we call uh, higher cardinality data, right? Uh, I've mentioned, I've said begrudgingly NetRAM disk CPU because I come from a performance and reliability world. And at the bare minimum, if you can't measure the, let's say CPU memory use of a, of a machine, right, then that's a problem. But we live in a world that's not just machines anymore, just virtual machines or whatever. We live with microprocessors, various different threads, containers, right, um, and now serverless functions and stuff. And so to get more finer grain, uh, when it comes to metrics, things like system level metrics like CPU, NetRAM, disk are what we call low cardinality metrics. And the reason we call them low cardinality is because it's very hard to associate with them with why are why are they how they are like you measure system cpu there could be a dozen or a thousand processes on that machine not to mention the sub processes and containers which are basically just linux threads but the the point is like there's so many things that contribute to potentially high cpu or high memory use and so that low cardinality aggregate sometimes doesn't really tell you much so that's why we're talking about, okay, how do we get closer to what's really going on in terms of the component trees, in terms of the various different technologies involved, and that we would call higher cardinality data. Up until the point where you've got that line of code I mentioned before, that was like, okay, well, at that moment where we have the metadata about the customer or the geo of where the thing is coming from, and we're emitting a, a signal or a metric about this process right here, we can tack on what we know, extra metadata, right? That that I would call it the higher end of cardinality because it's got segmentation built into something that you can later on measure, slice, dice, and do do interesting stuff. What this doesn't include, what open telemetry purposely does not include, is implementations of the backends, right? Um, though there are some open source stacks that exist. If you go onto opentelemetry.io, that's their main site, uh, the project site that has a getting started and that getting started includes things like some Prometheus uh, for, for metrics collection and maybe some uh, aggregation. There's also, I think Grafana is layered in there as well for a visualizer of Prometheus. And then there's all the OTEL stuff to help you report into Prometheus as a backend. But that, I wouldn't call that scalable. And most people actually have an APM solution, which by the way, remember, they've been playing catch up. Well, most of the APM solutions that are you know paying at all attention have already been invested in building extensions onto their platform 
that receive hotel metrics. So you can rewrite your stuff to be vendor agnostic because that's the way that the market is going, right? Regardless of whether APM vendors want it or not, but they need to be compatible with that new motion. Okay. So in, in actual practice, when it says backends um, for these, these pieces of information are usually going yes to a proprietary solution for storage and for other cool and interesting stuff. Um, but at the, at the top and the middle levels, it's all incredibly uh, compatible. Um, like I said before, some benefits, right, of, of doing observability in a more vendor agnostic way. You're not typing uh, your code uh, to a specific vendor, right? Uh, you decouple your code from the APM center point. Um, there are actually container native solutions that implement open telemetry now. So think about observability as important. Okay, well, if you've got, if you've ever worked with containers before, right, um, way to package up your software and execute it, hopefully more reliably than some special snowflake deployment script um, or worst case scenario, a human being going into servers and pressing buttons and making the configuration a mess. Um, Ruth will talk more about configuration management if she hasn't already. Um, the, the idea is if you've got a lot of these containers and you're like, wow, this is a good idea for deployment and, a, and operational transition, great. You end up with thousands and thousands and thousands of containers in production. Uh, and those containers are instances of your software running various different pieces and components. And then you go, dear goodness, what have we done? Right, because now we have no idea uh, what the security policies are of these things, or how to self-balance these things across shared resources, uh, how to route and do uh, network security properly. And therein lies where, okay, people have to start putting in a management layer to kind of go across all these things to provide those aspects, things like rate limiting or circuit breaking or um, you know, proper you know, security and, and key rotation and those kind of things, that usually happens because of a management layer. And when I say there are container native solutions that implement things like open telemetry now, Istio is a service mesh, which is essentially a management layer across uh, and embedded in throughout your container strategy, usually using Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes kind of as a management standard for clusters of containers but then you have clusters of clusters. So you have the same problem. So what they try to do is say, hey, across all those things, we have sort of this management layer. So those management layers can now have open telemetry kind of injected by default. It doesn't inject it down into your code, but it certainly does inject the auto instrumentation, the low level cardinality metrics, and some other things like traceability. Remember that traceability? If you start it in one place, well, every component has to have OTEL layered in to really propagate that down and then all the way back up. Unless you've got a management layer that's kind of putting something in front of all the requests coming into your actual running software, like Istio and sidecar containers. And so the requests are actually being processed both inbound and outbound before it hits your container by another small little things that Istio put in, the sidecar containers. So OTEL layered into those sidecar containers can automatically potentially inject trace IDs into your stuff. See, see where this is going? Because there are standards. Now, all of a sudden, we can do, do cool stuff. Um, so I won't spend much time on this other than say, because it's an open source project, because it's an open project to a lot of people, uh, there's no like one product team just saying, always saying thou shall. And there's no one product team saying we must ship on this, be damned everything else. Um, they do drive a lot of consensus. They do drive a lot of, um, uh, you know, people who show up help make decisions. And there are pros and cons to that, but I see more cons at this point than pros, uh, uh, more pros than cons. Um, the only con right now is that if you were to go out to some risk averse Fortune 100 and you would say, let's go implement open telemetry, maybe a couple of teams there would be like, that's some cool stuff. Let's do that. Let's try that out. People who are more risk averse will go, well, who else is running it? Can you get me a case study to prove that I should? What version is it? Where's our support model going to work? And a lot of this stuff isn't really there because number one, open source. 
but also because like there are so many different components like tracing metrics logs oh by the way the cross section of api sdk protocol based stuff and that's where you see but the good news is you can go to open telemetry io go on the docs and one of the first pages is like the compatibility matrix so you can see that things are getting better and better and i've seen this curve before this curve was if you've done any API work, you know that standards in APIs, how to describe the, the RESTful APIs are important. And so, uh, you know, maybe eight, nine years ago, I was deeply entrenched in the API space. Uh, and I was, be, I was able to firsthand witness uh, a lot of the decision and the thrash and the crazy business around APIs and specifically around API standards that started with this good idea over at WordNick uh, the folks at WordNick who are like, hey, let's describe a RESTful API endpoint without actually implementing it. Good for, you know, throwing this up and saying, is this the right design before you actually implement the code? Good for documentation and auto generation and client SDK auto generation. Great idea to have the spec, just like OpenTelemetry spec, in order to build implementation off of. And of course, Swagger got pretty uh, entrenched in some acquisitions and stuff like that. So a lot of the big players said, wait, we need to put this in a foundation. Now it's in the Apache Foundation as open API spec. That thing happened eight years ago. And I'm pulling in this notion in of the, um, the adoption uh, sort of curve here. Because, you know, back here, it was a technology trigger. It took a while once big companies like Capital One, um, various other European uh, situations started to adopt heavily swagger. Now all of a sudden there was a huge swell of influx of con contributions and make it better. And now we got to have standards. And then all of a sudden peak of inflated expectations and there were other API specs in the space that had to go away before one could emerge. Um, and then a lot of people basically were like, well, you know, it is what it is, it's, it's ubiquitous. And so now people by default usually have something that can either emit uh, from their RESTful API, whether you write it in, you know, Python or C Sharp or whatever, just like the old days, remember the old days of SOAP and XML, right? SOAP services used to always come with what's called a WSDL, right? A web service discovery definition or language, right? It, it, it admitted itself the the nature of doing work as a SOAP service required that you have the generic description of the endpoints and stuff there heavy because it's XML and complicated. I hate reading that. So we gave that up for REST and then REST was like, oh shoot, we need a service description language again. And so we're back at the point now in the API space where we have that around the specification formats. But if you see open telemetry, we were dealing with a mess of all sorts of different ways to do this for years before that. But between the time where open tracing and open census were like a, a, a thing to now where in 2021, there's more than likely going to be a 1.0 across most of these things. But certainly by 2022, I highly expect this to be an industry standard, right? If APM solutions, if all APM solutions do, don't come to the table with OTEL support, it's a joke, right? Um, if, if, if you're building systems that don't include the, nat the, nat the notion of, of observability and usually the best way to do that is the vendor agnostic way at first down in the code, therefore open telemetry. Um, that, that would be surprising to me. Of course, it does take time for large companies to adopt this stuff, but I think the adoption curve on this stuff is very different. It, it's not eight years, it's like three years at this point. So that's why I'm keeping my eyes out for it. Uh, that's why I do a lot of events about it. And I try to encourage other people to go, to all the other events that are also going to that. So you have a wide array of options. Um, and I think that's about where I should pause and um, maybe bring it back to Ruth for some questions. So are you all still awake at this point? Anyone? Okay, guys, if you have any questions, now's the time. You can put them in the chat window or feel free to use your mics, whatever works. Oh yeah, yep. Either will do. 
So while they're getting ready, um, how do you get over the configuration of systems to stop them to get into, you, you, you would end up with a very, very detailed view and you could end up with information overload. How do you find the balance in that with observability? Um, so observability, uh, at least the way that you define it should be meaningful signals. That's the word hook to say, what does meaningful mean? Well, it's subjective to everybody. No, no, it's not, not anymore. Um, I know what a meaningful signal is when I'm looking at a dashboard and I ask somebody, why is that important to you? And nobody can answer that question. That's not a meaningful signal. What is a meaningful signal is when somebody looks at something and, and goes, I think I know what this is about. And then very quickly can actually confirm that. Of course, there's a confirmation bias, right? Like, oh yeah, there was a problem yesterday. It, it looked like this. The problem today looks a little like that. So therefore it must be that. Let me look at that and make sure that, and then you waste your time because that's not really the problem. So really the more important thing is um, to move away from information overload. We need better technologies, mindsets, yes, but technologies and processes, person processes, mental processes, agreed team processes that say, how do we arrive at the things that actually matter uh, to our system architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So you, maybe you start greenfield application stuff, you start with an architecture diagram and there's boxes and there's, there's circles and there's lines between those things. And every time there's a line, every time there's a line, ask how are we gonna measure the, what does success look like between these two components, right? How would we measure that success? How would we measure failure? And that gets you into conversations about things like SLIs, how we measure the things at the bottom, SLO, service level objectives, of how as an organization, what we have to meet that are demonstrated with the evidence of SLIs, service level indicators like the metrics. The metrics are just your evidences, right? But what are the objectives? And to get into the conversation, to get into the, the habit of having the process conversation about how are we gonna measure these things it should start as early as the planning starts. Doesn't mean you can answer all the questions then, but it does mean that it's the right time to start thinking about that, engage earlier. And then by the time you get to the point uh, where you know maybe you, you think you wanna put it out in production or you put part of these out in production, uh, you don't end up with a bunch of dashboards that are all as data deluge overload, right? The, of, of meaningless stuff getting in the way of what's meaningful because you've already had the conversations and as a team you've started to uh, further refine what is meaningful information from the system but there is a point at which when you go to production when you release it as more people start to adopt your thing and more pressure and more uh, resiliency has to be built into the system there are things you don't know you don't know and that's why the the never accept a boss. I'm sorry. I'm, I'll go on my own. Never accept a boss that says, cool, we shipped that thing. We don't have to touch it again. No, you shipped it, right? Just like the life cycle of a plastic product as a designer, all of your designs are political. If you don't think that, you know, you're, you're fooling yourself. And it's the same thing with system designs. If you don't think that you're responsible in some way, shape or form ethically about the outcomes of that system, then you're fooling yourself. So par part of the ethics of building good systems is good systems that, you know, when you're not in the office and your team has to figure it out, that, that it makes any sense to them too, right? And to work as a team together, sometimes in academic or, or in like training and workshops, you work on your own thing, you ship your own thing, you get measured on your own thing. Sometimes you work with groups, but like that's not real until you actually have to deal with teams and on-call status and stuff like that in the real world in DevOps. So uh, I guess what I'm saying, Ruth, is that to move away from this notion of the deluge of information that doesn't matter, the easy, the easy way to answer that is to say, well, then we really need to collaborate together as early as possible about what really matters um, to measure in our systems and be okay with the fact that there are some things we don't know, but therefore we must have an iterative cycle of improvement so that, you know, uh, what is it? Another colleague of ours in the IEEE, Lynn Robert Carter 
said something great uh, on, a, on the last webinar, the SEI webinar, is that we often find cultures, engineering cultures, of, uh, of write once, read never, which is write your thesis and then never read it again. Oops, oh, I didn't mean thesis. I meant your retrospective docs, right? Like in a team, after uh, some kind of uh, failure or, or, or production incident, most modern teams require you to create a retro, a retrospective report about like, okay, what was actually going wrong? How did we try to, how, how did we arrive at understanding what that was? How did we fix it? And by the way, not just how do we fix it short term, but what do we put in place afterwards to do that? And so that goes into a nice doc somewhere in a wiki and, um, and then people uh, move on and do the same thing over and over again, which is the definition of insanity. Okay. So how do we move away from that write once, read never? We actually have to number one, put improvement, iterative improvement cycle in place and expect that from our employees, expect that from our colleagues, expect that from ourselves, right? To take time to step back and go, what are the things of all the details, the dirty work that come out of every day to pull that out and take the meaningful things. And hey, that lesson learned doesn't just sit in a document now. It sits on my primary checklist right above my shoulder so that the next time I'm about to ship something that's like that, or even if I just want to check and I want to go, hmm, have I thought about the traceability? Have I thought about the testability? Have I thought about the observ observability about the thing I'm about to ship? That it's easy to remember to do it. So, um, yeah, sorry, that was another five minutes. I, I just like to tell the students or remind the students that there's nothing Paul has said there in the last few minutes that you haven't already heard. And it's really good to hear from an outside perspective and to see that this is really as important as, as we've been saying all along. Um, there have been a, quite a few questions in the chat window. So um, I'm just gonna grab the last one. There's a lot of thanks, Paul, great great talk and so on. So I'm just going to get to this one. Yep. You uh, mentioned a great point about Fortune 500 companies not adopting open source due to support models and whatnot. With some of the APM oh. solutions on the market today, you're charged based on the volume of logs, traces, metrics, which is causing firms to log less, which yep. sometimes affects the ability to debug production issues. Yep. Fine line, but what are your thoughts? Um don't accept people who just uh, put logs on there for no good reason. There should be a reason why you're measuring the things you're measuring. Now, it would be in a perfect world, it would be great if we could just measure all the things, which is what the APM providers and the ob observability providers would love for you to do because that, guess what? Usage goes up, more money. But in a perfect world, if we could measure everything, um, is it really a perfect world? Because we're finite human beings. so there it goes back to that statement I was saying, like measure the right things. But there is this sort of like this gray area of like, if I only measure what I think I need to measure today, um, and I end up in a circumstance where I still don't know what's going on, that is always going to be a little bit of thrash. You're still gonna have to learn like, you know, what are the things I should be um, uh, in the States, we'd call this liberal about, right? What are the things that are likely the things you want to measure, but still not the pantheon of all the things versus only the things that like we're in the plan and only just measure those. Even if you start with that, you're good ish, but you should think about what are the, what are some of the wider and more common things as you go along. Um, I uh, yeah, there's, there's no specifics that I, I, but that's the approach I would take is just to say, don't, don't just be narrow in, in what you measure and don't just expect to do all the things. Um, I would also push back a little bit about, I didn't mean to say that fortune whatever's not adopting open source. In fact, we see the opposite is that we, for whatever reason, maybe uh, VPs and CIOs and CTOs read all these uh, articles about how open source is eating the world and yes, yes, yes. And so then they go, we need, we need the open source initiative inside our organization. Uh, only use open source uh, unless unless there's a really darn good reason build a business case. That's just some pressure, right? And it's good pressure, right? If if I have to justify why I'm spending money, that's not a bad thing. Um, the The problem is that because open source is free in terms of budget, right? Then 
it looks like something that can easily get into an organization. And aside from the security risks, aside from the uh, unnecessary dependency risks and the dependency sprawl that just pulling in anything you feel like because it's free causes, um, it also causes, it's, it's not, just because it's free is not a good decision to, to, to start introducing it into your system. So, mm -hmm. um, there's a good question about what the, what's the best way to choose the back end vendor for the open telemetry. Uh, try them all. <laughs> so, not always no, I mean, feasible, though. I mean, you, in a in a real system, you uh, if you were tasked with this by, let's say, your team lead or your director or something, and say, go figure us uh, a, for for this team, go figure out what's the best APM or back end solution for this, um, and what are the technologies involved. Oh, boy, I'm, I wish I, I I hope I I'm never asked that, but if I were, it would probably be go to the team and ask them what 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 do they like in terms of how to consume information when they are uh, on call, right? In a pressure situation, the last time you were in a pressure situation, what gave wind to your sails and what prevented your ship from being able to move? Like kind of like the sailboat retro, where it's like the water kind of impedes your, your, your motion, the wind gives you focus. So it's easy to ask people negative things like, what's not good about X and you'll get a plenty of, oh, I hated this and I hated that and stuff like that. But uh, let them go through that and then ask them, okay, what are the key characteristics of what works for you? What's worked in the past and then start to pull that. Once you get a common set of what we definitely do needs, right? What, what vendors might call minimum viable capabilities, MV, MVCs. Um, and what, uh, and then absolute, probably a, fewer list of those things, absolutely what we cannot accept, right? Then there's a lot of gray area to go out and say, okay, well, we can, we should start with this vendor because they, they light up the, the yeses and don't light so many of the no's as much as some other people do. So it's a, that becomes a uh, buying decision. Also reach out to people who've already done this. You know, it, I know it's early in careers sometimes, but like, you know, get connected as quickly as you can. I, I know a lot of this stuff takes experience and years to build a network of people who've been doing this and stuff, but you know, the people part of the people process and technology is the hardest thing to do, but it's also the most valuable thing. So, um, you know, don't, don't just assume that you have to reinvent the world of how to figure out what's right, but in the context of the team, right? And there's not just one team in an organization. There might be a handful of them that you, do this analysis for you kind of think about as you're building this out, especially SREs that have to kind of make these broader sort of operationally architectural kind of de uh, decisions um, on behalf of other people build better patterns. Uh, you might be dealing with, you know, portfolios of these sort of stated requirements here and there. So okay, there's a question about how you'd uh, make a microservice observable if it's not a green field. In other words, how retrospective? Yeah. The reward factors. How difficult would it be? Reward factors. Uh, what's the risk versus the reward with oh. regard to retrofitting a microservice to right. make it more observable? Um. So there, it's rarely uh, there are some more operational risks involved in introducing any new technology. You got to know what you're doing. And I'd suggest doing it on a pilot in a non-production environment. <laughs> that will learn. That will teach you a, a lot about how that works, um, even if it's not in a prod environment, and what to avoid. Um, I don't think there's any system that can benefit from more observability, but just like an investment portfolio, some systems don't need it as much as others. Right? There's no. There's no, <laughs> there's no one answer. There's no one uh, like context. It depends on context. So let's put it this way. If you know that there's a pretty critical system that only processes like a hundred transactions a day, but those are pretty critical transactions. Um, that's some information, right? Just write that on the board, right? Get the facts on the table of as, as high cardinality facts as you can, but like sometimes 
you're barely, you're lucky enough to, to get answers for some of these things anyway. Um, so get what, infor, what fact, information, not emotion about the system, not, uh, not feelings or ambiguities, but like get facts on the table. Um, and then about these systems, like how much they actually do how critical it is if they went down because look i like getting paid and so if, if you've got somebody in payroll that can't process the paychecks when they need to process them but guess what they only need to usually press that important button like maybe every week maybe every 15 days maybe every net 30 or something like that but to understand what the cycle of how important that thing is to be operational and reliable and be available those kind of facts on the table uh, really help you then to make a prioritiz uh, prioritization of, okay, well, I didn't realize that this microservice actually pro uh, is part of a critical chain that processes a million uh, transactions per, per day. Oops, a million versus a hundred. Are those numbers perfectly arbitrary? No, those hundred might be the critical reports to your sales team. And if they can't execute and they find out that it's, your the responsibility is on you to keep that system up and running you're gonna get you're gonna get your butt whipped so hard in business but is it as important as revenue coming in the door or existing customers like the importance of the thing depends on multiple factors usually in a business and so just getting facts on the table about which factors really will help people say yes i will if i had money i would sign a check for you to do that work Right. That's usually the way that or I will help you do that work. Getting their agreement to help you about getting the information about that system is another signal to say, hey, maybe that's more important. So from a microservice perspective, not all Microsoft's, uh, Microsoft's, not all microservices are created equal. All components in a system were created for some reason, but they're not all equivalent in terms of volumes, transactions, importance, um, availability and stuff. So getting facts on the table about that and then making decisions is very is, is a better way. I see one question. Do you mind if I uh, quickly read off? Can you see AI playing a role in observability going forward? Yes. Do you see performance testing and non-functionality being replaced by observability? No. Why? Can I, why? Because observability <laughs> is about seeing what's going on. Performance testing is about actually putting your, your, your thing in practice, putting pressure on that guy that I said is running on the treadmill Right, just sticking the 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 electrodes on him. Finally, I remembered what what they were called. Electrodes, I think. Just sticking the electrodes on him and letting him sit down will tell you what the state of your system is of your human system when you're sitting down. It won't tell you what happens over a gradient as we make that person go harder and harder. We put more load on their system. So performance testing, not just at large volumes but at small volumes is is not replaced by observability there is a blend some people say hey it's not real if it's not in production so screw everything else and let's just watch production you know who those people are people whose paychecks are aren't dependent necessarily on the hundreds of customers that they just screwed up by shipping the wrong bits um, there are usually people who are junior who have never had that pain and suffering before who have never dealt with hypercritical systems so they have no idea right like screw it ship it you know, there's a ruder way to say that is not a proper mentality. And so what I would say about performance testing and non-functionality, I love non-functionality, but I like operational, operational requirements instead of non-functional requirements, operational and, and uh, both functional and operational requirements aren't, aren't replaced by, by observability. Um, they're, they're augmented, they're improved by that. And actually, pre-release, right? Having good observability while you are doing pre-release testing is actually really useful too, because it speeds up the diagnostic of when things go wrong before you ship something. So mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I got to go. Yeah, that pretty much covers it. And I know you're on call to, to spare. Um, Paul, thank you very much for calling down to us today and giving us this talk. It was incredibly useful and I think everybody got a lot out of it and you can see from the number of thank yous in the chat window yeah. it it really did go down very very well so um 
appreciate that very much. And hopefully we'll have you back to talk to us again at some point in the near future. Yeah, thank you so much, Ruth. Thanks everybody for you know, listening to me. And um, I, hope, I hope this helps, you know, if it doesn't just rattle around in the back of your brain once every so often, uh, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and stuff. Uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. Okay. All right, cheers. So how about Paul? Okay.